Well, in the last lesson, lesson 11, we looked at the road to the cross, and in, in this lesson here, we're going to be looking at on the cross, and uh, we're going to be looking at crucifixion, what it meant, and uh, the history of crucifixion, and a few other things we'll be looking at as we go through uh, this lesson. So, with that said, and uh, I'm hoping that it's coming through a little louder right now. Uh, I'm having trouble with my volume. Uh, with that said, though, let us just start lesson number 12. What is the meaning of the cross? Simply put, the meaning of the cross is death. In ancient times, that is, from about the 6th century B.C. until the 4th century A.D., the cross was an instrument of death by the most torturous and painful of ways. Crucifixion was an ancient form of execution in which a person was either tied or nailed to a wooden cross and left to hang until dead. Death would be slow and excruciatingly painful. In fact, the word excruciating means out of crucifying. However, because of Christ and his death on the cross, the meaning of the cross today is completely different. In Christianity, the cross is the intersection of God's love and His justice. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The reference to Jesus as the Lamb of God points back to the institution of the Jewish Passover in Exodus chapter 12. The Israelites were commanded to sacrifice an unblemished lamb and smear the blood of that lamb on the doorposts of their homes. The blood would be the sign for the angel of death to pass over that house, leaving those covered by blood in safety. When Jesus came to John to be baptized, John recognized him and cried, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, thereby identifying him and God's plan for him to be sacrificed for sin. John 1 verse 29. One might ask why Jesus had to die in the first place. This is the overarching message of the Bible, the story of redemption. God created the heavens and the earth, and he created man and woman in his image and placed them in the Garden of Eden to be his stewards on the earth. However, due to the temptations of Satan, the serpent, Adam and Eve sinned and fell from God's grace. Furthermore, they have passed the curse of sin onto their children, so that everyone inherits their sin and guilt. God the Father sent his one and only Son into the world to take on human flesh and to be the Savior of his people. Born of a virgin, Jesus avoided the curse of the fall that infects all other human beings. As the sinless Son of God, He could provide the unblemished sacrifice that God requires. God's justice demanded judgment and punishment for sin. God's love moved Him to send His one and only Son to be the propitiation for sin. Because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross, those who place their faith and trust in Him alone for salvation are guaranteed eternal life. However, Jesus called His followers to take up their cross and follow Him. Matthew 16, verse 24. This concept of cross-bearing today has lost much of its original meaning. Typically, we use cross-bearing to denote an inconvenient or bothersome circumstance. For example, my troubled teen is my cross to bear. However, we must keep in mind that Jesus is calling his disciples to engage in radical self-denial. Remember, the cross meant only one thing to a first-century person, death. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, Matthew 16, verse 25. Galatians reiterates this theme of death, of the sinful self. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2, verse 20. Now, those who live in the 21st century, particularly in North America and Europe, are probably not going to face severe persecution for being a Christian in our lifetimes. Yet there are places in the world where Christians are being persecuted, even to the point of death, for their faith. They know what it means to carry their cross and follow Jesus. For the rest of us, our job is to remain faithful to Christ. We may never be called upon to give the ultimate sacrifice, but we must be willing to do so out of love for the one who saved us and gave his life for us. Question, what is the history of crucifixion? What was crucifixion like? Answer, crucifixion was invented and used by other people groups, but it was perfected by the Romans as the ultimate execution by torture.
The earliest historical record of crucifixion dates to c. 519 BC, when King Darius I of Persia crucified 3,000 of his political enemies in Babylon. Before the Persians, the Assyrians were known to impale people. The Greeks and Carthaginians later used crucifixion as well. After the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire, the Seleucid Antiochus IV Epiphanes crucified Jews who refused to accept Hellenization. Crucifixion was meant to inflict the maximum amount of shame and torture upon the victim. Roman crucifixions were carried out in public so that all who saw the horror would be deterred from crossing the Roman government. Crucifixion was so horrible that it was reserved for only the worst offenders. The victim of crucifixion was first severely scourged or beaten, an ordeal that was life-threatening by itself. Then he was forced to carry the large wooden crossbeam to the site of the crucifixion. Bearing this load was not only extremely painful after the beating, but it added a measure of shame as the victim was carrying the instrument of his own torture and death. It was like digging one's own grave. When the victim arrived at the place of crucifixion, he would be stripped naked to further shame him. Then he would be forced to stretch out his arms on the crossbeam, where they were nailed in place. The nails were hammered through the wrist, not the palms, which kept the nails from pulling through the hand. In ancient times, the wrist was considered part of the hand. The placement of the nails in the wrists also caused excruciating pain as the nails pressed on large nerves running to the hands. The crossbeam would then be hoisted up and fastened to an upright piece that would normally remain standing between crucifixions. After fastening the crossbeam, the executioners would nail the victim's feet to the cross as well, normally, one foot on top of the other, nailed through the middle and arch of each foot, with the knee slightly bent. The primary purpose of the nails was to inflict pain. Once the victim was fastened to the cross, all his weight was supported by three nails which would cause pain to shoot throughout the body. The victim's arms were stretched out in such a way as to cause cramping and paralysis in the chest muscles, making it impossible to breathe unless some of the weight was borne by the feet. In order to take a breath, the victim had to push up with his feet. In addition to enduring excruciating pain caused by the nail in his feet, the victim's raw back would rub against the rough upright beam of the cross. After taking a breath and in order to relieve some of the pain in his feet, the victim would begin to slump down again. This action put more weight on his wrists and again rubbed his raw back against the cross. However, the victim could not breathe in this lowered position, so before long the torturous process would begin again. In order to breathe and to relieve some of the pain caused by the wrist nails, the victim would have to put more weight on the nail in his feet and push up. Then, in order to relieve some of the pain caused by the foot nail, he would have to put more weight on the nails in his wrists and slump down. In either position, the torture was intense. Crucifixion usually led to a slow, tortuous death. Some victims lasted as long as four days on a cross. Death was ultimately by asphyxiation as the victim lost the strength to continue pushing up on his feet in order to take a breath. In order to hasten death, the victim's legs might be broken, which would prevent him from pushing up in order to breathe, thus asphyxiation would follow shortly after, see John chapter 19 verse 32. Question, why was Jesus crucified? Our answer, there are both an earthly reason and a heavenly reason Jesus was crucified. Simply put, the earthly reason is that mankind is evil. The heavenly reason is that God is good. The earthly reason Jesus was crucified, mankind is evil. Wicked men conspired against him, falsely accused him, and murdered him. The leaders of Israel had several reasons they wanted Jesus to be executed. They were envious of his following, Matthew chapter 27 verse 18. They were afraid that Jesus would gather too large a following, which might bring the Roman authorities down on the nation, causing them to lose their positions, John chapter 11 verse 48. They hated the fact that Jesus called out their sin publicly, Matthew chapter 23. And they thought he was blaspheming when he claimed to be the Son of God, Luke chapter 22 verses 66 to 71. But all these reasons were simply symptoms of their underlying unbelief, John chapter 5 verse 46. Jesus was crucified, rather than stoned, hanged, drowned, etc., because his execution was carried out by the Romans. Crucifixion was the method of execution employed by the Roman Empire to make an example of someone and to deter others from committing the same offense. It was normal to post the charges against the condemned on the cross. Pilate posted their charge King of the Jews on Jesus's cross Matthew chapter 27 verse 37. The Jewish leaders had made this accusation to goad the Roman governor into executing Jesus. 
John chapter 19 verse 12 reports, From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Pilate could not afford to be seen as tolerating a rival to Caesar. The heavenly reason Jesus was crucified, God is good. God had a plan to save sinners, and Jesus was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, John chapter 1 verse 29. Even though the act of crucifying Jesus was evil, the crucifixion was still the plan of God to make atonement for sin. Indeed Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you are anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen, Acts chapter 4 verses 27 to 28. The crucifixion was not a case of evil getting out of control. Jesus told Pilate, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. John chapter 19 verse 11. The powers of darkness were given divine permission to act. Luke chapter 22 verse 53. God allowed the hatred, the conspiracy, the false accusations, the sham trials, and the murder of his son. In the crucifixion of Christ, God used the evil desires of evil men to accomplish the greatest good, the provision of salvation for mankind. It was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10, the result was glorious, he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors, verse 12. There is nothing in Old Testament prophecy that explicitly mandates that the Messiah be crucified. At the same time, there are hints of the manner of his death in the law and the prophets. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, Paul applies Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 22 to 23 to the death of Christ. Crucifixion allowed for the piercing, mentioned in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 cf, John chapter 19 verse 37, Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. In crucifixion, the breaking of bones can be avoided, Exodus chapter 12 verse 46 cf, John chapter 19 verse 36. And the crucifixion of Christ perfectly fits the description of the anguish David faced in We all have committed sins, and we are all worthy of death, but Christ took our place. He was publicly executed, and his blood was shed on our behalf, as Paul explains in Romans chapter 3 verses 25 to 26, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In the final analysis. The reason that Jesus was crucified is the answer that each of us must come to understand and embrace by faith. Jesus was crucified to pay for my sin so that I can be forgiven and be made right for God. Today's question is, what were the seven last words of Jesus Christ on the cross and what did they mean? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective and afterwards, I'll share some helpful resources, so stick around until the end. The seven statements that Jesus Christ made on the cross were, not in any particular order, first, Matthew chapter 27 verse 46 tells us that about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here, Jesus was expressing his feelings of abandonment as God placed the sins of the world on him. And because of that, God had to turn away from Jesus. As Jesus was feeling that weight of sin, he was experiencing a separation from God for the only time in all of eternity. This was also a fulfillment of the prophetic statement in Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. Number 2. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Those who crucified Jesus were not aware of the full scope of what they were doing because they did not recognize him as the Messiah. While their ignorance of divine truth did not mean they deserve forgiveness, Christ's prayer in the midst of their mocking him is an expression of the limitless compassion of divine grace. Number 3. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke chapter 23 verse 43. In this passage, Jesus is assuring one of the criminals on the cross that when he died he would be with Jesus in heaven. This was granted because even at the hour of his death, the criminal had expressed his faith in Jesus, recognizing him for who he was in Luke chapter 23 verse 42. Number 4. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke chapter 23 verse 46. 
here, Jesus is willingly giving up his soul into the Father's hands, indicating that he was about to die and that God had accepted his sacrifice. He offered himself unblemished to God. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Number five, dear woman, here is your son and here is your mother. When Jesus saw his mother standing near the cross with the apostle John, whom he loved, he committed his mother's care into John's hands. And from that hour, John took her into his own home. John 19, verse 26 through 27. In this verse, Jesus, ever the compassionate son, is making sure his earthly mother is cared for after his death. Number six, I am thirsty, John 19, verse 28. Jesus was here fulfilling the messianic prophecy from Psalm 69, verse 21. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. By saying he was thirsty, he prompted the Roman guards to give him vinegar, which was customary at crucifixion, thereby fulfilling the prophecy. Number seven, it is finished. John 19, verse 30. Jesus' last words meant that his suffering was over and the whole work his father had given him to do, which was to preach the gospel, work miracles, and obtain eternal salvation for his people was done, accomplished, fulfilled. The debt of sin was paid. Was Jesus crucified on a cross, pole, or stake? The cross is arguably the most beloved symbol in all of Christianity. It adorns our churches and cathedrals, our jewelry, our books and music, and is used in numerous marketing logos. The empty cross symbolizes the work performed there by our Savior, who went to death willingly to pay the penalty for our sins. Among Jesus' last words before he died were, It is finished. John 19, verse 30, the law was fulfilled, the messianic prophecies were accomplished, and redemption was complete. It is no wonder that the cross has come to symbolize all that is the greatest story ever told, the story of the sacrificial death of Christ. This may come as a surprise to many, but the precise shape of the object on which Jesus was crucified cannot be proved explicitly from the Bible. The Greek word translated cross is storos, meaning a pole or a cross used as an instrument of capital punishment. The Greek word storao, which is translated crucify, means to be attached to a pole or cross. Outside of the Bible, the same verb was also used in the context of putting up a fence with stakes. Though storos can mean either pole or stake, many scholars argue that Jesus most likely died on a cross in which the upright beam projected above the shorter cross piece. But a biblical airtight case cannot be made for either a cross or a pole or stake. The Romans were not picky in regards to how they would crucify people. Historically, we know the Romans crucified people on crosses, poles, stakes, upside-down crosses, X-shaped crosses, such as the Apostle Andrew is said to have been martyred on, walls, roofs, etc. Jesus could have been crucified on any of these objects, and it would not have affected the perfection or sufficiency of his sacrifice. Certain cults, most notably the Jehovah's Witnesses, are adamant that Jesus did not die on a cross, and that the cross is in fact a pagan symbol. Their insistence on this point is curious, given the ambiguity of the Greek word, but they have worded their New World translation to say that Jesus died on a torture stake rather than a cross. Given that Jehovah's Witnesses also deny the deity of Christ and his resurrection, it stands to reason that they should object to other details of traditional Christianity. Arguing against the Jehovah's Witnesses' teaching that Jesus died on a torture stake are some indirect clues in the New Testament. One of these is found in John chapter 21. Jesus gives Peter a glimpse of the manner of his death. When you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Verses 18 and 19. The fact that Peter, who tradition says was crucified, would stretch out his hands indicates that Roman crucifixion usually involved outspread arms, such as would be positioned on a cross piece. The other clue that Jesus was crucified on a cross is found in John chapter 20. Thomas, in his famous moment of doubt, said, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Verse 25. Note Thomas's mention of the nails, plural, that had scarred Jesus' hands. If Jesus had been crucified on a stake or a pole, only one nail would have been used. The fact of two nails in the hands suggests a traditional cross. 
completely lost in arguments over the shape of the cross, is its significance to us. Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. The cross, or stake, or pole, was an instrument of death. By telling us to take up our cross and follow him, Jesus says that, in order to be his true followers, we must die to self. If we call ourselves Christians, then we must deny ourselves and give up our lives for his sake. This may take the extreme form of being martyred for our faith, but even in the most peaceful political settings, we must be willing to lose the self, crucifying self-righteousness, self-promotion, selfish ambitions, in order to be his followers. Those who are not willing to do so are not worthy of him. Matthew 10, verse 38. So did Jesus die on a cross? We believe he did. Could it have been a pole or a stake instead? Possibly, if we ignore Thomas's words in John 20, verse 25. But even more important than the shape of the object on which Jesus was crucified is that Jesus shed his blood for our sins and that his death purchased for us eternal life. What does INRI stand for? What was written on the sign nailed to the cross above Jesus' head? A presentation of God Questions Ministries. John 19, verse 19 records, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. John 19, verse 20 continues, Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Today, many times when the cross of Jesus is displayed, the letters I-N-R-I are placed on the sign above the cross. In Latin, the text, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, would have been written, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Udiorum. Abbreviated, this phrase results in I-N-R-I. It is unlikely that the letters I-N-R-I were truly on the sign that Pilate placed over Jesus' head, as John 19, verse 20 specifically states that the sign was written in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Although John's Gospel refers to the writing as a title, Mark and Matthew both refer to it as an accusation. It was customary to set up over the heads of persons crucified the crime for which they suffered and the name of the sufferer. The accusation on which Jesus had been condemned by Pilate was his claiming to be the king of the Jews. Ironically, the crime for which Jesus was crucified is not a crime at all, but an absolutely true statement. Not only is Jesus king of the Jews, he is the king of all, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Revelation 17, verse 14, and chapter 19, verse 16. He is king over all the universe and its inhabitants, and it was not any crime of his own that was nailed to the cross. It was the crimes or sins of everyone who would ever put his or her faith in him for salvation. He has blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Colossians 2, verse 14. Just as the title, King of the Jews, was written in three languages, so do those of all nations and languages recognize him as Savior, as indeed he is of all the elect of God whom he saves from all their sins by burying them in his own body on the cross, and of whom he is the able and willing, the perfect and complete, the only and everlasting Savior. Why did blood and water come out of Jesus' side when he was pierced? A presentation of God Questions Ministries. The Roman flogging or scourging that Jesus endured prior to being crucified normally consisted of 39 lashes, but could have been more. Mark 15, verse 15. The whip that was used, called a flagrum, consisted of braided leather thongs with metal balls and pieces of sharp bone woven into or intertwined with the braids. The balls added weight to the whip, causing deep bruising and contusions as the victim was struck. The pieces of bone served to cut into the flesh. As the beating continued, the resulting cuts were so severe that the skeletal muscles, underlying veins, sinews, and bowels of the victims were exposed. This beating was so severe that at times victims would not survive it in order to go on to be crucified. Those who were flogged would often go into hypovolemic shock, a term that refers to low blood volume. In other words, the person would have lost so much blood he would go into shock. The results of this would be 1. 
the heart would race to pump blood that was not there. 2. The victim would collapse or faint due to low blood pressure. 3. The kidneys would shut down to preserve body fluids. And 4. The person would experience extreme thirst as the body desired to replenish lost fluids. There is evidence from Scripture that Jesus experienced hypovolemic shock as a result of being flogged. As Jesus carried his own cross to Golgotha, John 19, verse 17, he collapsed, and a man named Simon was forced to either carry the cross or help Jesus carry the cross the rest of the way to the hill, Matthew 27, verses 32 through 33. This collapse indicates Jesus had low blood pressure. Another indicator that Jesus suffered from hypovolemic shock was that he declared he was thirsty as he hung on the cross, John 19, verse 28, indicating his body's desire to replenish fluids. Prior to death, the sustained rapid heartbeat caused by hypovolemic shock also causes fluid to gather in the sac around the heart and around the lungs. This gathering of fluid in the membrane around the heart is called pericardial effusion, and the fluid gathering around the lungs is called pleural effusion. This explains why, after Jesus died and a Roman soldier thrust a spear through Jesus' side, probably his right side, piercing both the lungs and the heart, blood and water came from his side, just as John recorded in his Gospel, John 19, verse 34. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, did the nails go through his hands or his wrists? The question of where the nails were placed goes to the question of whether Jesus was crucified on a cross, pole, or a stake. Some scientists have suggested that if he was crucified on a cross, as tradition states, the hands would not have been strong enough to hold his weight. Therefore, they suggest that the nails were actually in his wrists, which are considered stronger and more capable of holding his weight. Others have posited that the hands would have been strong enough, considering that his feet also were nailed and would have supported some of his weight. There is also some historical evidence that sometimes a cross would have a sort of seat to help support the crucified person's weight. While historical scholars are uncertain of the nail placement in Jesus' crucifixion, or anyone else's for that matter, the Bible simply says that Jesus had wounds in his hands. The Greek word translated hands means literally hands. There is no Greek word for wrists in the New Testament, even though some versions translate Acts 12, verse 7, to say the chains fell off Peter's wrists. But the Greek word in that verse is the same as in John chapter 20. It's possible that the nails may have been angled to enter through the hand and exit through the wrist, but it's just as likely that the nails were driven straight through the hand somewhere near the base of the thumb. Experiments have shown that both ways do work, and either way could have been used in the crucifixion of Jesus. Spiritually, the wounds of Christ hold infinite significance to us and are part of His glory, but their exact location is a minor issue. We know that there are five wounds, the hands, the side, and the feet. Although we don't know exactly where on the hands or the side or the feet, we do know that by his wounds we are healed. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. The wounds on his body brought about spiritual healing from sin to all who would ever believe in him. Well, this brings us to a close of Lesson 12. And uh, just looking at the cross, it really made my heart feel very heavy to realize that Jesus Christ had a go through that terrible ordeal of going to the cross and being crucified and it just really kind of touched me just going through these lessons so with that let's just close in prayer lord as i i think about your death on the cross and how cruel it was lord and how cruel the heart of man is to even uh, come up with this terrible torture and terrible death and Yet you endured the cross and the pain and the shame uh, to pay the penalty for our sins. It should make us realize how terrible our sin really is. And Lord, we just, all we can do is say thank you, Lord, for doing this for us. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen.